So onward to our speaker, uh, Dr. Priya Akwal, uh, Community History Fellow at the University of Oxford, where she received her DPhil in history uh, at Lady Margaret Hall. Dr. Atwal also completed a Torch Knowledge Exchange Fellowship um, from 2017 to 2018 with the project, The Indian Army in the First World War, an Oxfordshire Perspective. She has taught at Oxford and King's College London. And her first book, the subject of today's talk is Royals and Rebels, The Rise and Fall of the Sikh Empire. Published by Oxford and Hearst, this book has been described as a quote, dazzling history of the powerful women and men who forged a dynasty to rival the Mughals and the British. Um, and I attest to the fact that it, indeed it is quite dazzling. We will begin with Dr. Athwal and then turn to the Q&A at approximately uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time. And we will endeavor to close the session at 3.15 Pacific time. Uh, and uh, with that, I will now turn it over to Dr. Athwal. Thank you very much, Nilesh, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's sort of really, you know, lovely to be joining this seminar series today. Uh, it's a bit, you know, a bit later in the evening over here in the UK, um, but honestly, still great to be a part of this. And I'm also very much looking forward to the rest of the events that you've got lined up. Um, obviously, as you mentioned, I will be talking today uh, a little bit about my book, but essentially giving an overview of the rise and fall of the Sikh empire, which is at the heart of uh, the, that book's research. So um, it's, a, it's a quite an involved history. There's a lot that goes on within the sort of 50 year lifespan of this uh, very powerful kingdom. Um, so this is gonna necessarily be quite a basic introduction, um, but we've got time for questions. Uh, so I'm very happy to engage with, with everyone um, in the Q&A section. And then I'll also provide my contact details at the end of the session um, in the final slide so that you're welcome to reach out uh, via Twitter or via email and I'll get back to everyone uh, in the coming days. Um, so without further ado, I'll kick off. Um, okay, so the, the Sikh empire in Punjab, I'll give a quick overview of that in a second, but it's most, commonly um, you know, associated with its founding father, its so-called founding father, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, who is popularly uh, known, in, particularly in Punjabi and South Asian history, as the Shira Punjab or the Lion of Punjab. And he ha has achieved an iconic status within the history and historiography of South Asia as the, a great king, essentially. Um, of, of, of this kingdom in Northern India, which is of course today split between India and Pakistan since 1947. Um, and he is, you know, in, in, in most kind of popular history in particular, uh, widely regarded as having ushered in a golden age for Punjab, um, which is in some respects harked back to as an era of great prosperity, uh, wealth, as well as um, regional and communal harmony. Um, and a surprising, you know, in a surprising sense that although the Sikhs were a, a minority within the region of Punjab, that supposedly their great Maharaja, um, you know, essentially brought about a reign of uh, harmony even between Hindu Sikhs and Muslims in the region. Now, there's a great deal of hagiography around Ranjit Singh. Um, and I, I will delve a tiny bit into that today. Um, and it's not to take anything away from the man. He was an, obviously a fantastic, fascinating uh, historical character. He's most lauded definitely for the, um, you know, his, his qualities of governance, uh, but also his diplomacy and his uh, uh, conquering abilities and kingdom building abilities. And we can't, you know, we can't help but want to look back and ask some questions about this kind of historic history writing about Ranjit Singh. Um, in, in much European or Western history, we'd consider this a great man approach to writing history. And in many respects, um, it's quite fascinating that it's on, only until fairly recently that we've started to see new historical studies looking at um, alternative figures within his kingdom, 
be it um, other conquerors, uh, warrior figures such as Hari Singh Nalva, or other Sikh uh, political and religious actors from the time, or whether it be diplomats such as the Fakir family, um, a noble Muslim family who were leading thinkers within his darbar. And now today, for example, with my book, I've tried to bring about a conversation regarding the women and children of his family and the role that they had to play in the making of the dynasty of which he was the head, but also the kingdom of which he was the ruler. Um, so again, not trying to take the shine off Ranjit Singh, but trying to place him in context, not just in terms of his interpersonal and family relations, but also the place of his kingdom, the Punjab, within a broader South Asian and even global context. So again, this is just gonna be a, a kind of sweeping introduction into the Punjab of Ranjit Singh and of his dynasty today. Um, just to kind of give you some groundwork and to throw some questions out into the air about some new ways in which we could situate the Punjab of this period. Um, and then I'm more than happy, like I said, to take some questions and you know, have a conversation with you about this again in the future. Uh, so here we go, Ranjit Singh, let's take a little closer look. Um, just to quickly, you know, highlight some of the popular culture storytelling around him that we are, you know, increasingly proliferating even today. Um, very recently, a new statue, uh, well, a, a growing number of statues have been unveiled about Ranjit Singh, of Ranjit Singh, on both sides of the Radcliffe line, uh, in Lahore, uh, which was his former capital, and in Amritsar, which is, you know, one of the most iconic uh, Sikh cities or shrines in Punjab. And it's, you know, we, we've, there's debates going on about imperial statues, colonial statues, royal statues around the globe at this point in time. So it's fascinating that community subscribers have not only inaugurated the statue of Ranjit Singh, you know, in recent years, but also that it has become a symbol of both commemoration, celebration, and condemnation, with people chucking paint at the statue of uh, Ranjit Singh in Lahore, for example, in form of protest against the memory of, of, of a Sikh imperial rule in Pakistan. Nevertheless, there are also vast numbers of um, uh, Muslim heritage, Muslim led heritage organizations that are doing great work in Pakistan to uh, recuperate and restore and conserve um, many of the heritage sites that are associated with the Sikh empire and that Sikh legacy in Pakistan. So it's, it's a fraught picture. There's no one story to be told here. On the other hand, in Indian popular media a few years ago, as I was doing my PhD, there was also a very um, interesting, shall we say, uh, Indian drama series uh, made about Ranjit Singh's life, starting from his uh, boyhood up to his teenage years. And it was again known as the Shere Punjab, Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And it was a fascinating kind of um, foray into bringing Sikh history to a mainstream popular Indian um, commercial channel and broadcast, you know, around the world through uh, the globe to the global diaspora through um, satellite networks. And again, it, it, it kind of almost portrays Ranjit Singh as something like a guru in some respects, in that he's a guy who can, a young man who can do no wrong and impresses all with his wisdom. And it, both of these kind of models um, hark back to this idea of him that emerges from within the history writing of his own lifetime, both Punjabi and British, as I will kind of go on to show you, um, that he was this all pervading conqueror, this powerful great man, and also that the unification of Punjab was dependent on him, on his genius, on his will, on the strength of his arm and his sword, and that without him, uh, the Punjab was destined to crumble in the in the 1840s, which is eventually in 1849 when the kingdom lapsed. And this is a powerful myth. And it's um, again important that it has survived for this long um, or been so you know, powerful in its continuance. Um, you see it pervasive in the writings of, of Kushwan Singh, Bhutwan Singh, even very popular, very literate um, Sikh historians. And it's taken some undoing to, to kind of think about, well, if we, if we challenge that myth, what does that tell us about the broader history of Punjab? But in my view, uh, based on my own research, I think actually, if you look at the dynamics of his family, 
we can start to see how, you know, of course, <laughs> great man history needs some complicating. But let me quickly turn away from the man and now to the kingdom. So um, here we have a map of the Sikh empire at its largest extent, so around 1844. Um, the kingdom was, to some respects, uh, founded during the course of the 18th century in small stages um, by the efforts of Ranjit Singh's forefathers, his grandfather and his father in particular, Jarat Singh and Maha Singh. And these two men started with a kind of an outgrowth of territory in the northwestern regions of Punjab, um, in the sort of, in, unfortunately the city's not on the map. Oh my goodness. Was I, how did that happen? Was I muted all this time? No, no, just the last couple seconds, Priya. Oh, that's strange. Sorry, I don't know how that happened. I don't think I muted myself. Um, okay, anyway, sorry. So I'll quickly pick up. Um, this is the Sikh Empire at its largest extent. This is a map published within my book. Um, Ranjit Singh's kingdom was born out of the territory that was con initially controlled by his family's warrior clan one of 12 Sikh warrior clans that, uh, that, were, that were around in the 18th century um, that were known as the Missiles. And this was a group of warrior bodies that proliferated throughout the Punjab in the aftermath of the death of Guru Gobind Singh um, as a way of protecting the Sikh community from the ravages of both persecution, but also endemic warfare and raiding that was going on within the region uh, amongst tribal communities, but also uh, from Mughal governors, as well as Afghan repeated nomadic invasions. And in this kind of martial, rugged atmosphere, um, the military labor market was incredibly important to the kind of lifeblood of this region. And so the, Ranjit Singh's ancestors in many ways grew up fighting and trying to control territory and turn it into a resource not only for ensuring their own community safety but also for their longevity of their future and you have 12 warrior clans missiles in this period who initially are scattered around the Punjab but who under Ranjit Singh are unified into one kingdom and again this is a crucial part of that myth making around him that he was the, the man who brought the whole of Punjab together um, in, in this instance here, we, we've got the entirety of the empire. Um, Ranjit Singh becomes, he takes on the title of Maharaja in 1801. He conquers the capital city of Lahore just before that in 1799. Um, he's only 19 years old at this stage. And the kingdom survives until 1849 when it is annexed by the East India Company. Um, so it's not a relatively long lasting kingdom, but as you can see from the geographical extent of it, it was a significant sway the territory to be uh, encompassed under one dynastic uh, center of rule based at Lahore, but also it's in a really pivotal region for the geopolitics of Northern India and Central Asia. You have, it's essentially a buffer state between, if I quickly skip to the next map, um, it's essentially a buffer state between British India, which of course is rapidly expanding from the 18th century into the 19th century, and broader Central Asia, Nepal, Tibet, China on the one side, and then uh, Afghanistan, the Persian empire and the Russians towards the North and the West. And so in this map that you can see uh, from a kind of a British colonial textbook in many respects, the areas in pink or red are the uh, British controlled direct territories. The blue are the indirectly controlled princely states. And then the areas in green at the top, all of Punjab is the domain of Maharaja Ranjit Singh's kingdom. Now, something that I, you know, we have to recognize is that Ranjit Singh's kingdom, his, his power is born initially out of his struggle with the other 12 Sikh warrior clans, the missiles and how he endeavors to conquer, subdue, pacify, and amalgamate their territories, their elites, 
into his new kingdom. Um, and he does successfully manage to do that by hook or by crook. And I'll come back to some of those methods in a minute. But diplomacy, warfare for, and kinship relations are all at the heart of this. And what it eventually leads to, and I mean, as you can see from this map, again, he doesn't take, he doesn't manage to take over the entirety of the Punjab. The Punjabi states south of the river, uh, Sutlej, remain independent. And actually they come under the suzerainty of the British um, in 1809. But what happens in many respects is that you see Ranjit Singh come to dominate the Punjab. His, his clan becomes an imperial dynasty in many respects, which I argue about in the book. And he becomes toe to toe in terms of powerful status with the East India Company. Uh, what happens is that with that river Sutlej, it becomes the border line between Punjab as controlled by Ranjit Singh and the rest of British India as dominated by the East India Company or you know, in, in cohesion with those other Indian princely states. And that is the kind of friendship line that they maintain and that if any one power crosses that line it will lead to war and if anything that relationship between Ranjit Singh and the East India Company enables Ranjit Singh to have although he you know wanted ideally to have expanded into the Fulkia states it enables him to have a solid southern border and it gives him the impetus to continue span expanding up into the north which is why we see at the top uh, right hand side of this map that he's pushed, you know, under his uh, descendants, the kingdom continues to expand into even Tibetan territories and Ladakh, for example. Um, and it becomes a major player in the struggle for control over the mountain passes with Afghanistan. So this buffer region is, is hugely pivotal, but it's also this whole map of India, as you can see at this time, was a continuously moving chessboard and it was a really lively geopolitical zone, deeply competitive, deeply creative. And so we have to see, I think, Ranjit Singh as one man amongst many, uh, and not just a man, there's women and young children involved in this picture too, who are reinventing the map of India and reconfiguring the political chessboard in an era where the broader Mughal Imperium and even the broader Maratha Imperium was in flux. And so what I would encourage you guys to think about in particular in relation to a ongoing debate within the historiography of 18th century and early 19th century South Asia is just how fluid, just how creative and competitive this um, period was in terms of politics. And particularly to challenge this long held notion of, um, you know, the decline of the Mughal Empire leading directly to the rise or inevitably to the rise of the British. That is a, a real misnomer that more and more historians are increasingly doing away with. The other key point to bear in mind with this is, is also how that fits into Sikh Mughal historiography or history writing about the Sikh Mughal relationship. Again, that is something very fluid. And I think we can see that in this painting of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, for example. Um, I don't want to, you know, I didn't, I didn't have time to put loads of slides together for you, but there is very distinct tones in this painting of the way the Maharaja is, is depicted that echo similar Mughal style or Pahari style paintings of the depiction of Akbar and Shah Jahan and other Mughal elites who of course predominated in the Punjab um, of a couple of at least two or three centuries earlier and Ranjit Singh and his family openly and creatively um, drew upon Mughal history, Mughal artifacts, heritage, architecture and ideas to refashion a sense of new royal lineage in the Punjab. And it's not just the men doing it, it was also the queens um, and, and the young princes. And I will give you very briefly some examples of that a bit later on. Um, but it's not to say that just this new nouveau riche elite were doing this in terms of Ranjit Singh's dynasty. If we skip back in time, but forward in the slides, we, we see this with 
18th century depictions, Sikh artists depictions of the gurus in some respects too. Um, and I hope that everyone can see the caption on the side. These are some paintings from a really fascinating private collection uh, from a UK uh, private collector, the Samurai Collection. And on your left, you have Guru Nanak with Bhai Mardana, the first um, spiritual and temporal head of the Sikh faith. And then on the right, you have Guru Gobind Singh, who is the last acknowledged human guru of the Sikh faith. And, you know, as many recent scholars have particularly shown, Louis Fennec, J.S. Garawal, um, Koshora Singh, amongst others, the Sikh engagement from the gurus onwards with the thought, political thought and the spiritual thought of the Mughal elites of their time, starting from Babur, um, and, and there's some debates about whether Guru Nanak met Babur or not as well, uh, but starting you know, through with these rulers who they engage with directly throughout their reign, that Mughal ideas, Indo-Persian ideas of political thought and of time and of you know, the ruler's relationship with God were all being played with within uh, the Guru Granth Sahib and within the courtly circles of the Guru's Darbar. Um, and so within this sphere, the, the model of monarchy as a way of ruling was very much prevalent within Sikh thought. And so the question that some popular scholars have grappled with, you know, why was Ranjit Singh a monarch, um, is, is one negative that is often raised about him actually in some, in some popular biographies, why, why was he a monarch? Does that not fit with a Republican model that Sikhi supposedly espouses? Well, actually, no. Um, it's something that the gurus themselves were playing with, a metaphor, the king as a metaphor, monarchy as a metaphor, for thinking about just relationships in the world. And so if we hark back to this map, this debate about forms of power, about who can be the real, legitimate successes to the Mughals in the Punjab and across broader South Asia is a big lively feature of this new um, political chessboard that's taking shape in, in 18th century and 19th century South Asia as the Mughal rule began to decline and as new players came into the picture. And so it was, it was up to people like Ranjit Singh to be creative and represent themselves in new ways in order to, to seize this opportunity and see that he did. Um, if I very quickly skip ahead now to another map here. Um, in this map, <laughs> I, this is a map from my PhD thesis. And um, I'm gonna very quickly give you an insight into this in order to give you part of the dimension of the rise because I know I've only got about five minutes left and it's, uh, there's lots to still to say. Um, in this map here, you have a very, shorthand way of looking at where Ranjit Singh's wives came from, uh, as well as the wives of his three adult, um, well, two adult sons and his grandson, all of whom became Maharajas immediately after him between um, 1839 and 1843. In total, although I've got individual dots for locations, behind these dots, we have a sum total of 43 women. So that's 43 wives for Ranjit Singh, his two sons and one grandson, all married within the space of about 40 years. And this, for me, actually is pivotal as a new way of thinking about the gendered construction of this Sikh empire. In some ways, it echoes the marriage strategy of Akbar, the Mughal emperor, in which a form of dynastic colonialism operated. And I explain my use of that term in my book. Um, but why I call it that is because what essentially happened in this period is that as Ranjit Singh sought to overturn the competition between those 12 warrior clans that I told you about previously, and as he sought to grow his dominion throughout the region of Punjab, gradually, you know, as, as the, his rule started to increase, it, it was accompanied really intriguingly by a marriage policy that spread also throughout that territory and which enabled him to incorporate women of varying different religious communities, backgrounds um, and regions directly into his growing dynasty and shifted it away from being a very uh, territorially located based in Gujaramala military clan 
to a dominant imperial dynasty that spread its tentacles throughout the region. And these women have not yet been given sufficient credit for the, for the impact that they had, um, because we're only just coming to terms with who they were, where they came from, and how much influence they were able to wield. But I printed in full as much detail as I could about their names, family origins, financial power in the appendices of my book. Um, and of them were born at, the, at least six children to Ranjit Singh. We don't know if he had any daughters, only the sons are listed, and then there were various grandchildren thereafter. But it's intriguing that within the colonial historiography of Ranjit Singh's kingdom, the fall is often attributed to the failings of these male and female family members of Ranjit Singh. Uh, people like his wife, mine again, um, and his two sons, uh, Gorak Singh and Shir Singh and, and others, essentially that the, the heirs and successors of Ranjit Singh were nowhere close to, um, you know, holding, carrying on his torch once he passed away in 1839. Uh, but this is some of the narrative that I try to unpick in Royals and Rebels um, by essentially going through the colonial history writing back to front um, and unpicking the layers and the contradictions and the inconsistencies within colonial accounts that were written from Ranjit Singh's lifetime onwards and amongst which certain debates became more, uh, more certain narratives became more favored and dominant than others. And nowhere is this more evident um, in, than in the final example in the Regency period of Maharani Jindgaur, who was Ranjit Singh's last wife, his 30th wife, and the mother of his youngest child, Dilip Singh, who is sat in the center of this painting here. And these two were the final two rulers of Punjab in the kind of really pivotal uh, last five years of the kingdom um, from 1843 onwards up until the kingdom's annexation in 1849. And in their period, effectively, history writing um, became a live feature of the decline of the kingdom. And what you saw happening was this chap in the middle, um, Henry Lawrence, effectively writing his way to fame in Punjab uh, through a series of popular articles and even a novel um, depicting the history of Punjab, but using it, using his, essentially yielding his pen as a way to produce a historical narrative as well as a, uh, I guess a propaganda stream for a particular political policy towards the Punjab, leveraging its status as this buffer state to, to, to build up his own career as an authority on the region and to leverage that authority to seek a political standing to work as the resident in the Punjab. And how this came about was in 1845, you have the first Anglo-Sikh war and that that, that Rubicon, the Sutlej River, was crossed by Sikh forces. There are all sorts of controversies about how this war came about, but it led to conflict between the British East India Company and the Punjab, resulting in um, the annexation of half of the state, sorry, at least a third of the state, the state of Jammu and Kashmir being separated off and made an independent princely kingdom, and Henry Lawrence being imposed with a garrison force to control the government of Maharani Jindgaur, the last queen. Um, and there you see this real gendered struggle take place between a kind of British colonial vision of what an Indian princely kingdom should run like and a, a much more authentic, but still shaky uh, indigenous tradition of the involvement of women and children as political figures, as ambassadors, as proxy rulers um, and as important dynasts in, in a very significant region. And um, I won't go into that too much now. I think it might be better if I leave it for questions. But essentially what I wanted to say was is that with, with the, this sort of story that I've unraveled today is not only in challenging the kind of myth-making around Ranjit Singh for whom actually, you know, Henry Lawrence considered Ranjit Singh a hero and actively promoted him as a model patriarchal ruler, as a kind of a weapon to attack Maharani Jindgaur in order to 
hold her up to a standard of rulership that she really was never actually expected to follow, but which enabled the East India Company to impose a model of government on the Punjab that suited its own purposes and suited its own comfort system in a way as well. Um, but that this history, these, sorry, these um, layers of history writing, if we start to unpick them, and especially if we employ a broader lens on the sort of South Asian dynamics to this, and not just a purely Punjab focused one, firstly it enables us to look at the wider chessboard of South Asia at this time and how the Punjab played an important role within that, but also how the Punjab was influenced by these broader movements. But secondly, if we bring a gendered lens to it, we also begin to unpack the rather singularly focused, um, overly focused great man dynamics within this history and to unpick some of the more cultural and intellectual layers to this history as well. Um, so I'm going to pause there. I'm going to allow for some questions. There's so much to talk about. There's, as I said, 43 wives, so many sons. If anyone's got any questions about specific events, specific characters, I'm more than happy to drill into it. Thank you so much, uh, Priya, for that wonderful uh, discussion and framing of this topic, which, as you mentioned, uh, allows for so much to talk about. Uh, I would say just a few uh, words of reflection before opening it up. Uh, one um, insight that you left us with that I think is extremely important is the interconnected nature uh, of both the rise and sustenance expansion and then fall of the Sikh empire within a broader world of kingship and politics, um, projection of power, relationships with other state forms that the Sikh empire cannot be um, separated from. And that, I think that's one major element of, of this work, as well as the pivotal role of, of queens as well as princes, as you uh, introduced, and I, and I think there are so many um, avenues for, for further discussion on those lines. Uh, I would like to now open it up for questions from anyone uh, in the audience. Uh, whoever has a question, please uh, make your hand known through the hand raise function, and uh, you will then enter the screen. Um, as we're waiting for questions, if there are, aren't any, one thing I'd like to uh, ask about as a way of continuing uh, what you had uh, begun is, is to, to return to a point that you made in the beginning about a tension, if we want to call it a tension, between uh, the various ideals that emerge from within uh, communities around Guru Nanak as well as the Sikh community, egalitarian ideals and values that sit at some level in tension with what the Sikh empire actually did and how it was run. And that tension, which you pointed to, um, is an interesting side of historical debate, an interesting side of, of politics. And I'm wondering if you could speak about how that is understood in the present, this, this tension, uh, and, uh, and then we'll move from there. Well, I think there's, there's so many different ways in which people today and, and it depends on where you are in the world, especially within the Punjabi diaspora, how, how we might look at the memory of the Sikh empire and, you know, and even calling it the Sikh empire in, in some respects is a, you know, I don't want to say contradiction in terms, but it's, 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 it's complicated. Um, I mean, it's a term that, that a term of reference that emerged in the 20th century. It was not how the kingdom was referred to in Ranjit Singh's time or in his, his successor's time. Um, so, you know, it, it's got its own history, the way we, we're talking about this. And I think it's because in the 20th century, um, Sikh thinkers in, in you know, uh, just immediate, uh, roughly kind of India as it's becoming independent, were beginning to acknowledge that and, and feel uncomfortable about the fact that it had been, the state had been operated as a monarchy they had concerns, and I'm talking particularly about Kapoor Singh and his, his work, the Parasara Prasna, uh, and Kushwan Singh and Putwan Singh and various other scholars to leverage that um, much later for some of their more popular historical arguments. But there have been debates ongoing, you know, within, within Sikh and Punjabi academic scholarship for several decades before and after that, that do acknowledge the role of monarchy, 
that do acknowledge the role of conquest in the making of this Punjabi kingdom. Um, not just because it was rooted as an idiom of politics and political thought all the way through from the gurus and, and thereafter, but also because, you know, this was going on throughout the subcontinent. Um, so there, there's, there's, two, there's two strands to this, really, in terms of the playing out of the politics then and how we're thinking about it as historians today is, what does it mean to use monarchy as a metaphor or, an, or a form of collation of ideas for thinking about power and power relations and sovereignty. But what does it also mean to then enact that power, right? And it was down to the 18th century generation of Ranjit Singh's ancestors and then Ranjit Singh and his immediate family uh, just around then and going to the 19th century to think about how do we take forward the legacy of the gurus and how do we enact this? And this is not just a Sikh problem. Um, you know, this, this conception that we have of Sikhi as a Republican religion arises again, specifically in the 20th century. And it's interesting that, again, this kind of context of India heading towards um, the, the, the departure of the British, the creation of new nation states, scholars are starting to think about these ideas and thinking about, well, we had a kingdom, we had our sovereign independence, we have lost this. We're entering a post-colonial moment, hopefully. How can we resurrect ideas from the sick past to create a new free future? And I think it's fascinating how these layers have compounded on each other and how we're now reevaluating this today. But today there's no like concept of bringing back a sick monarchy, right? No, I don't think anyone, they, we might have debates about Khalistan or various other things, but I don't see anyone advocating for a Maharaja or a Maharani to come back, right? There may be debates even about bringing the Queen all out of the Tower of London, but no, <laughs> nothing beyond that. So it's, it's a complicated debate, but I think there needs to be more space actually to reevaluating the con our conceptions of monarchy within debates about sovereignty in Punjab, past, present, and future. Thank you for that. I would just uh, like to uh, mention that one point that you raised, which is very important, I think, is that the even the terms we use to speak about this polity uh, emerged from after, um, you know, from a later time in history, and the sorts of values that are often associated with the notion of Sikhi come, come later in time, so that there are multiple scales of, of thought and history and politics that have to be seen in one uh, context as you lay out uh, in your book. Uh, we have a few questions um, uh, now. I'll start with uh, Rita Damun. Hello, thank you so much, uh, Priya. My name is Rita Damun. I'm in political science. I'm really interested in your work and the way you're thinking about gender um, and the role of the queens and um, disrupting the myth. I think that's a really important political project. So one of my questions uh, to you, I'm not a South Asia scholar, I'm not an India scholar, but I'm really interested in Sikhi. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the, my questions to you is that I'm trying to make sense of how after the guruship period, um, we saw kind of this almost like a secularization or Brahmanization that happened uh, during Ranjit's um, empire. And part of that, from my reading, is that because of the way he kind of reintroduced Hindu cultural practices. Um, so I'm really interested in, in your research, what you learned about caste um, and some of the variations and, and how that shaped and shapes our understanding of uh, the Sikh empire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's a complicated question with this, essentially. Um, this, this notion that there was a normative idea of Sikhi pre-Ranjit Singh and that he then corrupts this in some way or that he, he changes it. it not, corruption is quite a you know, loaded term, but he changes it in for some reason or purpose. Again, it's an idea that you find in in Kapoor Singh's work and, and in, in the work of other scholars of the time, Gan Singh Nabar and, and others, that, and that becomes a concern going into the second half of the 19th century, particularly when you have uh, Christian missionary activity much more actively in the region and the more 
hardening of the greater hardening of religious identities between Hindu, Sikh, and Muslim uh, in response to these these changes. Um, I think the one one thing that has struck me from a from a longer term reading of Sikh history, and I'm still figuring this out. I can't say that I have specific answers for everybody at this stage. Is that the Sikh community has just has been just as div internally divided along lines of sect, sects and uh, not just sex with an X, but with a CT, um, as well as ideology and of rituals as any other community. Um, and you see that within the time frame of the gurus, there was no necessary, you know, that, that the ways in which we have compounded our history of the guru lineage and of the kind of attributes of Sikhi that we you know value and, and think of as important today, whether it is Miri Piri, whether it is the martial kind of identity, the San Sipai identity, or whether it's of the Khalsa, you know, the gurus faced challenges and dissent and, um, you know, kind of cleavages within the Bund in their own day, and were continually having to uh, reconcile with that or, 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 or deal with it. And so with Ranjit Singh's period, we, we can't forget that he was a Sikh Maharaja of, you know, a minority community, otherwise majority Hindu Muslim populations. And so to an extent, we can see why a, a sense of secularization did take place. Um, and and we, what I think we have to kind of stay away from is this idea of him as a religious thinker. He was not. He was a political figure, so he engages in a political relationship with Sikhi as well as a human spiritual one. And so there's going to be an element of fluidity there. But to be honest, my work is not a study in that sense of his religious practice and his deep relationship with Sikhi. What I was engaged with was what it meant for him to be a king in this, in this environment, right? And I think this is again a broader conversation that we, are, you know, we need to think about more deeply and more broadly, um, because it just feels that there is these sort of stories that we tell about this period, sweeping kind of narratives um, about a sense of a uh, contained Sikh identity that needs to be unpacked and. I only covered this within one chapter of my book, and it's amazing how much has been read into that chapter, but actually it's just an overview chapter, <laughs> and there's so much more to be delved into, but I think it's such a rich area of questioning that we, we need to reevaluate essentially, because, you know, it, it stems from the immediate aftermath of that loss of that kingdom that you see these hardening of religious identities and that, that notion of these hardened religious identities continues to shape our worldview. Mm -hmm. um, so if we, if we find a way to put that to one side and, and think about this again, I think it would be really enlightening for all of us. And within that, a question of caste. I didn't touch that, but it's, 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 it's integral to it, to be quite honest. It absolutely is. Yeah, I don't think we can think about the empire without thinking about caste. So, but thank you. I totally agree with what yes, you said thank about you thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Neenish, I can't, I can't hear you. Sorry, okay. So we, we are just a bit over uh, time, but I want to make sure that we hear from the students who have questions. There are two students who have questions here, and we'll start in order. And the first uh, question is from Neha Munshi. Hi, thank you, Dr. Bose. Uh, sorry to turn my video off. I was having technical difficulties. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul, for such a fascinating lecture. Uh, I have a question about the siege of Lahore and what kind of resistance did Ranji Singh face from Afghans because they were mm -hmm. very powerful um, at that time uh, and were they continued threats to the Sikh empire? So I think, let me just check that I heard your question correctly. You were talking, mm -hmm. asking about were the Afghans a continued threat? Yeah, and were they 
were they uh, and for in the siege of Lahore were they, were they the main people that Ranjit Singh fought against okay. in the siege of Lahore yeah okay so I'll take that second question first and I'll come back to the Afghan one okay so this the okay, siege of La Lahore in in 17 in the 1790s that where Ranjit Singh essentially takes over the 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 capital city it was a former uh, both Mughal and Afghan you know, in short succession, it was the capital of Punjab under both kind of overlord powers. Um, but it was, had been essentially taken from Afghan control by another Sikh warrior clan, the Bungis. And so some of their, their Sardars, chieftains, were holding, were living in the fort and were controlling the city. And it was a number of Muslim merchants, bankers, um, who had invited Ranjit Singh's group, the Sukhrajakiyas, to take over the city. Um, he was, you know, not so far away in Gujranwala in sort of northwestern Punjab. And they, they were admiring the situation with him and his, his conquest, and they essentially asked him to come take over the city. So actually, it's a Sikh on Sikh battle. And that the vast majority of the of the battles that Ranjit Singh fights in the early era of his reign are Sikh on Sikh. So again, we we have to remember that <laughs> within this, uh, you know, that the the Sikh Empire is built out of internecine, you know, Sikh on Sikh warfare in the first instance. So who who is he internally colonizing first? It's his own countrymen, his co-religionists, and we think we have to think about the ethics of that in terms of diplomacy and warfare and all the rest of it. And who is coaching him in the ethics of that in this siege? It's actually his mother-in-law, Sadakor. So I had to skip over that slide because I just had too many things I was trying to say and it's late in the evening and my brain is fried. But <laughs> essentially it's his mother-in-law. He was a 19 year old guy and he goes to battle. He manages to, to knock the Bungies out but he has to negotiate a diplomatic settlement with them. And he's not inclined to do that. And it's interesting that the very hagiographical Persian sources of his day are hot on saying that he was the great conqueror. But they even they acknowledge, the Sohan al Suri's Umdat Uttavarik acknowledges that it was his mother in law, Sadakor, of another rival clan who provides troops, who supports him in this conquest, and who actually negotiates a peaceful settlement. So, and, and reminds him that, you know peaceful diplomatic negotiations would be much more favorable. Otherwise, these cl other clans could rally the troops and, and knock him out. And that they are Sikh brethren at the end of the day, who he has to find a way to work with. So these layers are really interesting in terms of the operation of this politics. But you know, later on, when he becomes even more powerful, he finds a way to knock Sadakor out too. So that's where I use, where I employed this term of dynastic colonialism, because it's the building of that dynasty, the building of that marriage network that I showed you all in the map was a part and parcel of the growth of this imperial power and went along with a balancing of, in, 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 an, in an ironic way, sick notions of egalitarianism. Um, but it's, it's a messy picture <laughs> and it doesn't always go well for him. On the Afghan question, it remains fraught. The relationship remains fraught. Ranjit Singh builds a very powerful, deeply modernized army, leveraging um, that very fluid military labor market that exists in Punjab and recruiting soldiers from all different uh, religious and uh, regional backgrounds. And again, that, that strikes a challenge to Khalsa norms of only employing Sikh soldiers, only employing uh, your co-religionists and giving them honor and status. Um, he completely modernizes that army, uh, bringing in new artillery, bringing in uh, former Napoleonic officers, even changing the uniforms that the soldiers wear and moving them away from older Sikh kind of guerrilla warfare type models. And that makes them a formidable military force and, and is part of the reason why the East India Company regards Ranjit Singh as this frenemy figure, as I kind of mentioned in my abstract, you know, someone not to be messed with but someone that they're prepared to challenge maybe later on if things go in their favor. So they, between the two powers, the Punjabs and the British, they keep the Afghans at bay. Um, Ranjit Singh's not inclined to align himself with the Afghans. And again, you know, this chessboard thing that I talked about all the way through, he, he's offered a number of alliances throughout his time. 
You know, he could have he could have sided with the Afghans against the British. He could have sided with the Marathas against the British. He could have sided with the Gurkhas against the British. People flirt with him from different parts of that region all the way through. But Ranjit Singh chooses not to and chooses to align and loyal, loyally align with the East India Company until his death. And the kind of crowning achievement for him in some respects was the 1838 tripartite alliance where he actually goes against um, the ruling Baruksai clan to try and put Shah Shuja, uh, a, a former Afghan king, back on the throne at Kabul. And it's a disaster zone, but he doesn't live to see it collapse. So that, that again, the Afghan Sikh or Punjabi nexus with the British is a really important part of the geopolitics of this time. Um, and there's so much more to be done about that beyond William Dalrymple's uh, Return of the King book, I think. <laughs> so many more interesting theses to be written because uh, it's, it's a really rich area for further study. So thanks for your question. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question here, uh, and it is from Yishang Fu. <clears throat> Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much for your very interesting and uh, inspiring uh, speech. Um, I am sorry, I have, I, have, I have three questions. Maybe maybe <laughs> you cannot answer all. Uh, okay. <laughs> one, one question you uh, would like to answer. The first question is that uh, you mentioned uh, the difference between some uh, Indian scholars and uh, uh, the uh, colonial historical writing, right? So the, my first uh, uh, question would be, uh, how do you conceive the contemporary uh, Western academia on Indian history and the Indian academia on Indian uh, history? Uh, what are the dif difference uh, in terms of style, perspective, or methodology, or uh, all this kind of thing? That might be difficult to answer because uh, different uh, scholars are, are very different. Uh, second question is that uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the the uh, the Maharaji, I'm sorry, I, I forgot his name. He he married many women, right, from different uh, uh, social backgrounds, from different uh, ethnic groups, from different uh, social classes, and you said this kind of a, a reflection of the society that he conquered. And it's kind of related to networks, and and but my my question is that I think that some sometimes maybe I I might be very naive. I don't know South uh, South South Asian history very well. Uh, I think that as for some more influential uh, figures, daughter maybe those wives are very kind of uh, a kind of a sign of political. Uh, allies, but for some girls from lower class, for example, you mentioned some Muslim dancer girls. Are these kind of things we can say is a political ally? Maybe we can say it's only for the Maharaji's personal pleasure, mm -hmm. right? Maybe not so much network and this kind of political things in it. And the final question would be. Uh, you mentioned the Bangi missile and the the the, the Maharaji's uh, missile, right? So I, I I checked on on internet that Bangi is both a name of a Sikh missile and also a name of a caste in India. So is is this kind of two things related or or something like that? Oh, th thank you very much. Sorry for having <laughs> <Okay. that question. laughs> I won't, I won't be able to answer all of those. I'll, I'll take the ones that are most direct to the presentation, I suppose, if that's okay. So that was the colonial history writing and the Queens. Um, and I can help you with the others separately if, if, if you need help with those. Um, so the, if I speak on the Queens first quickly, that's probably the easiest one to answer straight off the bat. Um, you know, you're absolutely right that the, these, you know, the, the matches were not equal in their impact or in their um, conception in some respects as well. Um, the marriages, for example, to the Muslim dancing girls were love marriages, you know, 
Dilip, uh, Ranjit Singh married two famous um, uh, uh, Muslim courtesans from um, Amritsar and, and thereabouts, Mora, Bibi Mora, and um, um, Gulbegum, Bahar. And they were, you know, as far as we know, in, in both the literature of the time and thereafter, they were marriages of the heart. Um, but it's not to say that they didn't become political in import thereafter. It's not to say that they weren't political when they happened. He crossed the line. He was about to have crossed the line uh, by the Sikh religious authorities of the day by marrying a Muslim dancing girl in the first place. And uh, when he married Mora in, in the kind of the early stages of his reign, and he was punished uh, by the Sikh religious authorities of the Agartha, um, the kind of the, the sort of temporal, the spiritual leaders of the Golden Temple, the, uh, what's known as the Golden Temple today. What Ranjit Singh made the Golden Temple by donating gold for the decoration of the shrine at Amritsar. Um, he, he was sentenced to having whip, whipping lashes on his back for having cavorted around town with his new Muslim bride. And that was seen as wildly inappropriate by the religious heads of his time for a Sikh king to do. So he had to prostrate himself in front of those spiritual figures and, and apologize and offer to take on any punishment that they offered, uh, that they, they forced on him. But it's interesting that another sort of 10, 20 years later, he goes and does the same thing and no one punishes him at this time. So in some respects, there's a barometer of his political power and authority in between those two marriages. But beyond that, we have to look at the role that those women themselves played in, in, in their lives and in the politics of that time. And although they didn't have much to say about the marriage situation, what both queens end up becoming are some of the wealthiest women within the Lahore state and huge patrons of art, of culture, of education in their own right from this newfound wealth. But also they were land ladies um, territorial figures now themselves. And the sad thing is we've, we've got very few remaining historical documents, records that tell us about the lives and the, the actions of these women. But what little I was able to find and that we still is emerging is that it's clear that for example, Gulbegum was in charge of troops and she could send them to go and manage her estates and she had full control over what she wanted to do. So essentially she becomes part of the landed nobility of the Punjab at this time. And Mora, for example, is patronizing scholars who were traveling from central, from the Middle East and Central Asia through to um, India and, the South, and broader South Asia um, via, of course, the pivotal region of the Punjab and Lahore, much as had happened during the Mughal reign, right? And it keeps that continuity of culture and knowledge and influence, therefore, moving through the hub of Ranjit Singh's Lahore. And so, okay, they might not have been active political figures, but in terms of soft power, in terms of cultural power, they're really important. And that's replicated over time and time again by those other wives in various different ways. And I mean, I was only able to start to scratch the surface by finding their names and by finding snippets of what they were able to do. And what I don't want to do is romanticize the women as in the same way that Ranjit Singh has been romanticized. That's not my goal. But I, what I want to show with that, that these women existed, that they had roles to play, is that th there, was a, there, was a sh there was a kind of a, a, a spread of power and a spread of influence throughout this dynastic network. And, and it wasn't just by, by the, amongst the figures at the top, but also how their kinship networks were like a, a, a web, essentially, that spread throughout the kingdom. So the wives, brothers, fathers, mothers, cousins were embedded in local villages, you know, throughout the kingdom. And they were also a way of linking back up to the capital city, to the power of Ranjit Singh and his court and all the rest of it. And that, I think, is a really interesting structure of power within this kingdom. And it was something that was, of course, going on throughout South Asia in different kingdoms and different ways throughout this period. And so if we're going to challenge, if I go back to your first question about colonial history and the lens through which it views the history of the Punjab, the history of royalty, um, the history of politics throughout South Asia in this time, you know, it's this Victorian dichotomy in some respects between public and private that you cannot, and, and also the gender dynamics that the politics 
the, the power, the his, real history happens on the battlefield or in the courts or, you know, in the, in the, the colonial guard's tent or whatever, right? It can't happen in, in the harem or um, in the ladies' quarters or however you're conceptualizing it. I mean, these women weren't all confined to a harem for one, but Orientalist historiography would tell you that they were, right? Or they would tell you that they were debauched, debauched, you know, immoral figures. So it's a totally what if we if we bring these women, we bring those children, we bring these kind of figures into the picture more and we look at how they're operating. It enables us to explode some of the colonial mythology and, and sort of simplification of how South Asian politics worked at the time. And it, it helps you to explode the gendered oversimplification in particular and, and the separation between public and private. Um, but it also enables us to think about how the colonial project was also implicated in some of that, right? And as I very briefly mentioned at the end, Henry Lawrence writing historical narratives in order to write his way into political office in the Punjab. But even within his sources, right, even within his writings, we see moments of tension, moments of slippage where he acknowledges what Maharani Jinsbor was doing, what other Punjabi women or South Asian women were up to, because you can't just, you know, ignore stuff. Sometimes stuff slips through, even if you really want to do them down. And so it was by reading some of those colonial sources against the grain, alongside rereading a new Punjabi and Persian sources from the period, as well as the material culture, that I was able to start to piece together that framework. So I'm not saying we should dismiss colonial history writing by any means. It's valuable, it's insightful in its own way. But when you look at the tension between and within, we start to see a much more complex, rich, interesting picture of South Asian history, both local, regional and global for that time. So I'll try and leave it there. Hopefully that's wrapped it up. But if there's any more questions, please do just email me or tweet or, or get in touch later on. Thank you uh, so much for that uh, lovely response. And at this point, I will have to close the public part of the program. Um, and uh, thank you for everything that you have offered us here, including this wonderful book. Um, for those who are joining us uh, from the broader public, uh, I would just like to mention uh, that we are uh, meeting again next week uh, at uh, 4.30 p.m. Uh, within this series, and our speaker is Professor Bali Sahota, and the title of his talk is Philology of Another Future, Revisiting Ernst Trump and German Orientalism, follows in many ways from some of the discussions we've begun about the meaning of Sikhism and the meaning of Sikhi, which comes together in some senses, I think, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and uh, for those who are in the class and for the speaker, I'll ask you to please just stay logged in uh, for a few minutes. And uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. And goodbye to everyone who came in from the public. And we'll hopefully see you uh, next week. <laughs>